when my parents were growing up, um, like my grandma was married off at 12 because the village needed babies. Do you want to go back to a world where we have to like marry off our kids so we can make babies so they can be workers? Or do you want to live in a privileged world where your biggest problem is addiction to TikTok? Hey everyone, good morning. I hope you guys are all having a great day. In today's video, Abba sent me a video on loneliness and I thought we would watch it um, and then I'll react to it and we'll see. I definitely want to continue the conversation on loneliness. So I really appreciate him um, continuing it as well. So I'm very excited to see uh, what we'll learn today. Is America suffering an epidemic of loneliness? That's the question raised by some new data showing that increasingly in ways that were accelerated by the pandemic, Americans are choosing to spend more and more of their time alone. So here is that data. It was laid out by economist Bryce Ward in a new Washington Post op-ed. Basically, if you're looking at this chart, up until 2014, the amount of time Americans 15 and older spent with friends was more or less stable. Then a dramatic shift happens that you can see here. The amount of time with friends and companions plummets the amount of time spent completely alone skyrockets. Now, it's important to emphasize this trend clearly predates the pandemic. In fact, the amount of time with friends fell further in the five years building up to the pandemic than it actually did during the pandemic. Now, this trend is also pretty consistent across all demographic groups, among mm. the old, the young, the rich, the poor, the remote worker, and the in-person worker. Increasingly, Americans are choosing to spend more and more time alone. And as with so many... You know what's interesting? Sorry, I just want to pause right here. Um, when I was growing up, we didn't have the internet, of course, because I'm ancient. Then we got the internet, and that became amazing. But my friends I had in the neighborhood stayed, and then the friends I made online always changed. It fluctuated. The people I was meeting on the internet still fluctuate to this day, actually, which makes sense as a content creator. I'm not always going to have the same audience, though some people do stay for many, many years. And I will say that I think that this trend obviously makes sense with new technology, but also I think there was also a political uh, deviation that ended up occurring because I know that a lot of my friends in Seattle during this time, at least at the time they're talking about, they were really alienating themselves from their friends and family pre-COVID over politics because people were feeling like if they weren't going to be seen, then they weren't going to socialize. And And being alone feels a lot better sometimes, but then you wake up one day and you realize like, I'm alone and I need something more. So I think there's something happening on, on multiple fronts. And I, th I hope they go into that. But let's keep watching. Many things, the pandemic just poured gasoline on a trend that was already well underway. A raft of recent reporting provides texture to what all of this alone time looks like for different age cohorts <laughs> and demographic groups. As reporters and researchers have tried to understand a new epidemic of teen mental health crises, they've taken a close look at how teenagers have shifted from in-person socializing to online socializing. And take a look at these two charts. This is from The Conversation. The one on top you see there, it shows what percent of teens say they meet up with their friends almost every day. This chart starts in 1970 and goes through 2017. Now, at first, on the left side, the numbers slowly decline across the graph before falling off a cliff somewhere around 2010. The chart on the bottom shows why it matters, because at the same time that teens are seeing their friends less, they are also increasingly describing themselves as lonely. In 2017, almost 40 percent of high school seniors agreed with the statement, quote, a lot of times I feel lonely. I really need lonely to be defined. Is lonely not having anyone to hang out with? Is lonely not having people see you? My VC asked me that the other day. Like, what was the time you felt the loneliest? And it was just not being seen, you know, not being understood, talking and people saying like, you're an alien, you feel weird, this doesn't feel normal. Me having to mask or me having to act differently or me having to, you know, forego my core self in order to appeal to my bubble. I will say, though, that somebody described loneliness as basically saying that if I kind of died, then the only person who would know was my landlord because I didn't pay rent. And I thought that was really um, relatable, I'm sure, for a lot of people. Um, I'm on the other side of it where I feel like I'm always surrounded by people who want my time, but they want versions of me or parts of me or, you know, very particular versions of Britney where, again, the only time I feel truly seen 100% of the time is with my partner, which I think makes sense. But that doesn't mean that I don't feel very lucky that I'm seen partially in different ways by other people. It's also satisfying. It's just for me, when I think of loneliness, it's a matter of 
how much I'm being seen and to what capacity. Like sometimes when I'm even with my own sister, I'll say like, man, I don't really feel seen by you right now. And that makes me feel lonely, but that doesn't mean I'm alone. So I think there's like two things we have to describe and we have to be okay with feeling lonely and being alone. So I'm okay being alone. I don't feel very lonely often, but even in the presence of some of my best friends, I can feel lonely. So again, I think we need to really have a conversation with ourselves over what is it being alone and what does it mean to feel lonely? Because in a room full of people, I don't always feel seen. And so I think that this conversation should be had in a very philosophy way. The question of the why, the who, the existential dread we all feel. Why do you think you're on this planet? If you're a person like my brother, who's very Catholic, he only has Catholic friends. He feels very seen by his Catholic friends. It's not that his secular friends weren't lovely as he was growing up, but he didn't feel as seen by them. So he felt really lonely. Recently, I saw him and I was like, bro, you look like joyful. He was like, yeah, I think I've really just found my bubble, right? He's found his ecosystem where he thrives. He's still single. He's nearing 40. He's a traditional Catholic. So he's very, you know, by the book. You know, he's been very consistent with his religion. He doesn't feel lonely anymore because he finally found a group of friends that see the most important part of him. His religion is a core identity in his life. So he needs it. You know, as a queer kid, when I'm with queer people, I don't always feel seen, but I do feel more seen than when I'm with straight strangers. So ironically enough, because my identity is so strongly queer, I can be in a room of queer people and feel lonely and still feel more seen than in a group of straight people where I feel lonely and less seen, just because at least we have this one thing, right? It's like, it's maybe not important. It's probably superficial, but it's something better than nothing. So it's not that I don't like hanging out with straight people, but like I just, it's not the same. Now, my straight friends that I have that I love, those people don't see me because I'm queer. Those people see me because of something more. Maybe we grew up Catholic. Maybe we both love the same things. Maybe we have the same experiences. Maybe we just experienced enough of life together that it made us feel like we were in it for the long haul. And then, of course, you guys know that I separate my friendships into hierarchies of inner circle, ride or die, close friends, everyone else, you know, my inner outer circle, everyone else. And then I think about my obligation to all those friendships. Like you guys know, Not So Erudite and I always talk about how we negotiated our friendship because that's what I need in life is to know what is my obligation to you versus assuming I'm owed something just because I feel lonely or because I want to feel seen. Does that make sense? My allergies are killing me. Okay. Also, I just want to say I was a teenager at a very different time, 2005 to 2007. So I was like in high school, in public high school, and then I was homeschooled before that. But I had lots of friends growing up. Um, But I never quite felt as exactly as seen as I needed to. In high school, it was really hard for me. Bullied out of high school, betrayed in high school, lied about in high school. It was just the worst. And I was mentally ill and also trying to come out as queer. It was really, really awful at a time when like gay people definitely were not in. So That was really difficult, but again, I uh, made it through and I found people throughout my life that were better for me and then worse for me and then better for me. I went from friend group to friend group to friend group, and I think that's what normal life is. I think this like leave it to beaver or I guess like um, family matters version of like you make a friend, you keep a friend. Maybe if you're lucky. I have one friend from my childhood that's inner circle. We've known each other over 22 years, and she's amazing, but we worked together to maintain that. A lot of her friends who have also known her that long – They don't maintain a closeness with her like I do. She always asks, like, why are you the one friend who always maintains a closeness? And I'm like, because you're like my sister, bro. I want to make an effort in your life to make it clear to you that I love you and I want to be in your life. But none of her other friends make quite an effort the way that I do. And I'm the only friend who goes to her parents' house and is treated like a second daughter because, again, I make an effort to also love her parents. I do a lot of emotional labor in order to maintain friendships. And frankly, almost the only people in my life who get to stay are the people who make those efforts, but also that we're meant to be together, not to be so spiritual and woo-woo, but I just don't think we're meant to be with the people we know all the time. Just because you know someone doesn't mean you're meant to be with them, right? Like Abba said in our conversation about loneliness, he needs his friends to be in the same city as him. I don't need that. I need loyalty. So I don't need you to be in my same city 
I need loyalty and I also need a symbiotic relationship. Like we're both actually getting the same thing from each other. And then I have really great friends that I talk to once a year on occasion or sometimes we text. And those friends are amazing and wonderful, but I can't be their 2 a.m. calls, right? There's only so much Brittany to go around. So again, when you say you're lonely and then you're alone, I need you to have a conversation with yourself about what why that is, but also what you actually want from friendship. Same way you would think about a lover or dating or getting married. What do you want from that relationship? And then what do you want from friendship? Because if your friendships are meant to be important, then you will treat them with the same importance, right? So while teens are undoubtedly socializing in a different way than previous generations, it's also clear that the online social interactions are not filling the need that real life social interactions once did. Mm. Let me show you one more graph that is really disturbing. This is a chart showing a dramatic spike in emergency room visits for self-harm among kids and among adolescents. Now this trend starts in 2009 and continues. Okay, hold on. Let me let her finish. He's unbroken since then. Now, I don't want to oversimplify. Loneliness is just one of a number of factors that might be contributing to a breakdown in teen mental health. But we know human beings are social creatures. We don't do well when we are completely isolated. Mm -hmm. We've also talked some here about a crisis facing men and boys. Part of that crisis appears to be a loneliness crisis. New York Times just wrote up some of the data here showing that men are in what they describe as a friend session. Since 1990, the number of men who say they have no friends at all have seen a five-fold increase up to 15%. Meanwhile, fewer than half of men say they are actually satisfied with the number of friendships that they do have. Could this be part of the reason for men dropping out of the workforce, suffering from addiction, dying deaths of despair? Okay, so this is um, obviously, um, well, I'm a woman and I have brothers and most of them have really solid friend groups. Some of my brothers have like four or five, six friends. One of my brothers or two of my brothers maybe have one close friend, one, and that friend's married and doesn't even live in the same state as them, but they're doing okay. Other people have, like, I have eight brothers, so all of them have different variations of friendships, right? One brother has, like, literally no friends because he burns every bridge he makes with every friend because he's an asshole. But, like, you know, that's life. Grow up. And so that's the problem, too, as well. But all of my brothers do struggle with being, I guess, extra vulnerable with their guy friends. So they usually talk to their girlfriends or their sisters, me. Um, But that's not always enough. They want to feel seen in a different way. So I will say that they turn to religion to often give them that thing. And since most of these men, I assume they're doing these statistics on, are probably secular, they're not exactly getting that met. Religion offers you community consistency and structure. And if you're a secularist, you might not get that. Now, I'm not saying that the statistic asks people their religion, but often if you're part of a true religious community, you often have those things in those communities. Now, again, my older Catholic brother that was struggling with loneliness when he was straddling the lines between a secular bubble and a religious bubble said that he stopped being lonely the moment he realized that he needed to be seen and having only Catholic friends made that made that happen. Um, When you're in subgroups, let's say a BDSM group, there's also subgroups within that subgroup. So I used to belong to a dungeon that was BDSM, but also had um, magic nights and D&D nights. And I wasn't a part of those subgroups, but like my partners were because they all played those games and they would go to those events. So even within a BDSM subgroup, there's also a subgroup that wants to still be friends via uh, board games or tabletop games. So again, when you're looking for friends or to avoid being lonely, you need to also have that conversation with yourself about why. What are you looking for? Because it can just be, um, I want to feel good about myself. Like, okay, depending on why you think we're on the planet, we're probably just evolved animals over time with no great purpose. Or maybe you're religious and you think we're special and we're like made in the image of God. You need to decide what reality you're living in so you can change the perspective of loneliness. Again, because I think we're evolved animals over time, I don't think I'm owed friendship, love, or companionship. I think I have to earn it by being a good person and being clear about what I want from other people without leading people on or misusing um, my time with them. But again, I have made friends with like hardcore leftists, progressives, who say they advocate for mental health and then after six years of friendship, ghost me. And I'm sitting here as a borderline and wondering at what point did their values allow them to ghost a friend of six years who have got, who's gone through so much with them, right? Never inner circle, but still very close friends who has borderline, i.e. abandonment issues. Like who, what part of their value system that said they advocate for the mentally ill allowed them 
to do that to somebody. They're lucky that I'm strong and I didn't want to kill myself over it because I was already past that point. I was already past my self-harm stage. I was already, though I have intrusive thoughts every day that want to do it, I, I was past it. If they had probably done that to me prior, it probably would have impacted me the way it's impacted me before when people have ghosted me. So again, I have been ghosted by friends, accused by friends, only to have them come out years later and say they lied. I have had so many ups and downs with women, men, non-binary people. I've had so much conflict with people because no one knows what they want. I am convinced that everyone doesn't know what they want. And so they're confused about why they're lonely. It's like when you're dating and you don't know why you're on a date. If you're not religious, so you're not getting married, like you're not dating to get married and have kids, you might not even know why you're doing what you're doing. Are you really following your joy? Or are you just like appealing to some bubble that's told you you should do something? If I could ask my friend, like the recent one who ghosted me a year or so ago, if I could ask her anything, it'd be, it'd probably be just like, why? Why wouldn't you just end the friendship with a negotiation? Why wouldn't you just say, Brittany, I've enjoyed our time together, but I'm feeling like we're going in different directions and I'd like to end this friendship. Why would you ghost me? Did you think I was so heartless that I wouldn't care about our friendship? Or did you think I was so stable that I could handle being ghosted by somebody that I thought saw me? Either way, I can't cry about it, even though I did. I have to get over it. I have to say... Well, that's one less person that didn't see me enough to do right by me. So instead of dwelling on it, I mourn the friendship and I move on, right? And now I have this great inner circle and this wonderful partner and everything is great, but I'm 33 years old. It took quite some time for me to find the people I could trust, the people who wouldn't just ghost me because life got hard, the people who wouldn't betray me because we voted differently, the people who would be loyal. For me, loneliness is predicated on loyalty and being seen. I know when shit hits the fan, my inner circle will be there, right or die. Even if I'm in the wrong, they will hold me accountable while still not condemning me. Versus other people, no offense, you all ditch your friends easy peasy just because they vote different. So like when people say they're lonely, what does that mean? Right? I don't know. Are elders also increasingly riding out their golden years solo? More than a third of households headed by someone. Okay, hold on. First of all, America, y'all treat your old people crazy. I'm Middle Eastern. Our old people, we they live with us. So I, no offense, during COVID, one of my friends was like, Brittany, my grandma's in a home and she could die from COVID. I was like, why is your grandma in a home? How much do you care about your grandma if she's in a home? You know what I'm saying? There better be a good reason your grandma is in a home. Because like for me, if you put your relatives in a home, you're basically saying I don't love you. So again, are seniors spending their life alone because you don't love them or because they were such bad parents they deserve to die alone? Because don't forget, some of y'all had really abusive parents and for good reasons, let them die alone. And I think that's another thing that people are missing is that a lot of people had plenty of good reasons to let their parents die alone, which I think is the harsh reality that nobody wants to face. Over the age of 50 has a single occupant. That means almost 26. Sorry, one more thing. And if you're only having one to two kids, yeah, bros, that's how it goes. Versus my mom has 10 kids. And, and to be honest with you, a majority of us always come home for Christmas. A majority of us are still in her life. A majority of us love my mom. Um, like literally nine of her kids are still active in her life. And the one kid who isn't, well, he's not active in anyone's life because he's a mess. So, okay. So again, why, what kind of families are you forming? Are you staying in touch with your kids? Are you honoring their feelings? Um, my parents and I have a very like boundaries relationship, but obviously uh, as siblings, we always talk about like who are mom and dad going to live with, who's going to take care of them. And like three or four of us are really making sure we have good money in the future so we can take care of our parents. Well, I think a majority of Americans, no offense, none of y'all are thinking about that. Six million Americans 50 or older are living alone. That compares to 15 million back in 2000, a dramatic increase there. Now, the reasons for this, again, it's complex. Changing norms around marriage, childbearing, all of that contributes. But it also matches up with the overall trend of Americans of all walks of life spending more and more time alone and reporting being lonelier and lonelier. Now listen, some people, they might be wired for solitude, might be perfectly happy living alone, being alone, but as we have spent more and more time alone, more and more of us are reporting those feelings of loneliness. Mm -hmm. And there is all kinds of research about how loneliness is bad 
for your health, causes you to age, can lead to mental health issues, can fuel societal ills. Loneliness is one of the core factors in the societal rot that we cover here regularly from things like addiction to despair to violence and to radicalization. Mm. So what is to blame for our drift towards loneliness? Now the smartphone, surely one part of it. Surely. In Ward's Washington Post op-ed that we started with, he points out that 2014 was actually the year smartphone penetration crossed 50%. Mm. Was also the year that we started detaching from our friends more and more and more. Now, there is nothing about this particular technology that should cause us to abandon other important parts of our lives in order to worship it. But as per usual, let's follow the money. There are fortunes to be made in keeping us glued to the screen. Mm -hmm. After all, spending time with our friends or the proverbial touching grass. Okay, so like, you know how she's stating something that's duh? And I really dislike how many people are like, Brittany, you always state things like duh. Like everyone knows that. Then if you know it, why the fuck are you not fixing it? Like, you know what I'm saying? Just knowing something doesn't mean you're going to do shit about it. So she's telling you right now, this thing is getting you addicted. Stop it. And you're just going to be like, hmm. So again, I have to put the onus on us. I have to say we're responsible because if it's not us, then then you have no power, like zero power to change your life, right? And if you're not going to do it, that's fine. But I believe in free will personally, and I think you have agency and I think you're stronger and better. And if you're ready and if you're willing, you can make your life basically anything. If the world wanted, we could be a peaceful nation, but it's not going to choose to do that. And you're not going to do it either. And we're not going to choose to get along and we're not going to choose to stop our addictions. And we're not. So again, the world is exactly the way it is because we all decide it's how it's going to be. Right. I get my groceries delivered because I don't want to leave my house. I allow siblings to live with me, though. Once I get married, eventually, whenever that happens, I will want my partner and I to live alone. And again, I chose my partners particularly after being very picky for many years and not letting anyone get to a second date because I was not willing to trade my peaceful alone time for being married to someone where I felt lonely. So many people report that they're lonely in their marriages. So again, it's not just about having someone. It's about what you're willing to do to fight loneliness. My friend asked me the other day, how much of existence, everything outside of yourself, okay, are you willing to endure or tackle or be challenged by in order to keep existing, right? That's yourself, you're existing. And that's the question I want to ask you. You stay alive, you maintain your jobs, you sort of exist, but why? What is the point of existing if you're not going to make an effort to really have the life you desire? And I know everyone makes an effort in different ways and everyone's satisfied in different ways. So I personally, if I'm feeling physically lonely, I'll hire a sex worker. I don't care. If I'm feeling physically lonely, I'll go to a slut area and I'll be slutty with somebody else. Yeah, it's not exactly what I want. It's not as fulfilling, but it's better than nothing. For some people, they're not willing to do that. I have plenty of friends that would rather be touchless single for years than do that. And that's fine. But I think that's kind of a problem. Then join a jiu-jitsu club, join a wrestling thing, do something where you're physically contact, you have physical contact with people, right? If you don't want to, that's fine. But again, the world, the world we're living in today, let's just say for America, because that's a really privileged country, you have access to so many things for free. Park events, social events, free museums, you have opportunities to join bowling groups, everything. But if you deny all of those things, then you have a mental health issue. You need to go to therapy. If you can't afford therapy, there's plenty of free therapists on YouTube who do videos helping people along the way to self-reflect. You have access. At some point, it is just your fault. And at some point, it is also a health issue, a mental health issue, a do you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be like cruel. I'm trying to be a realist, though. So unless you think you are a gift from God placed on this planet, you're just an evolved animal over time or placed here by aliens or we're in a simulation or whatever you believe it is. It's something and it's informing how you're acting. And I think that's super important. She's telling you right now, touch grass. If you're not going to do it, I don't think you have the right to complain. It's not really profitable for anyone. Endlessly scrolling is. 
it's profitable for the companies selling its crap through targeted ads, and it's profitable for the companies selling the targeted ads to those companies selling the crap. And for the companies analyzing where we are, what we search for, what we click on, and every other little bit of data that they can possibly scoop up to monetize. The end result is we are both the consumer to market to and the product to be sold. I'll give you an example. I had a TikTok last year and I liked it. I was like, oh, TikTok's fun. And then I realized like when I was working out at the like working out, I was like scrolling and working out. And I was like, this is dumb. And I deleted TikTok off my phone. And I just didn't put it back on. I know that's really hard for some people because like I'm addicted to YouTube. Like I love YouTube. I have YouTube on in the background all the time. But the point is, is that YouTube is something that I don't have to physically interact with. See how TikTok keeps you scrolling? Like you have to physically interact with it. So I eliminate, and this is called discipline, I because my mental health has to take priority. So I'm choosing myself. Do you see how I'm being selfish? I'm choosing Britney's joy. So I'm not choosing TikTok. If you are convinced TikTok is your joy, you are just an addict, right? Which I don't blame you. It's quite addicting. If you find yourself in an addiction situation, get help. If you can't get help, again, are you an evolved animal over time on a planet? Are you a secularist that doesn't have a religious like creation story to tell yourself? Because if you're religious, you can go to your religious communities. If you're a secularist, you have to either have to accept you're a lonely lion, right? Or you have to become a part of a pride, like a pack. You have to decide how you're going to socialize because you're the only one who can tell people what you need. If you don't know what you need, how can people give it to you, right? The longer they can keep our attention, the more profitable we ultimately are. On a deeper level too, we're better consumers when we are lonely and sad. Tempting to fill our emotional needs with consumer goods is the American way after all. Yeah. So what is the answer here? It requires nothing less than a government-regulated shift in the entire tech ecosystem to keep our attention from being plundered and sold off to the highest bidder. A national shift to reprioritize civic life, community. They've tried this a billion times. The governments try. It's not going to work that way. Not in America. That's why you have to do it yourself. They're not going to do it for you. They don't want you to do it for you. The government has a social media website. The government has an Instagram. They don't want you off the the internet. They want... they. You cannot rely on other people the same way you could in the past. But even in the past, it was more for survival, right? When my parents were growing up, um, like my grandma was married off at 12 because the village needed babies. Do you want to go back to a fucking world where we have to like marry off our kids so we can make babies so they can be workers? Or do you want to live in a privileged fucking world where your biggest problem is fucking addiction to TikTok? Like, do you get what I'm saying? You have to pick and choose. Do you want to live in a world where we're back to like forcing our children to make babies so they can like make workers? Like, I want you to really hear me. Or do you want to stay in a world where at least the biggest problem is TikTok addiction, which is a big deal. But again, you're playing a completely different game and a much easier game than our ancestors. No offense, I'd rather deal with OnlyFans girls than 12-year-old brides. So again, you have to make a decision. Do you want to live in a world where you're waiting for someone to do something for you or where you can just put down the fucking phone? And I know if you say you're addicted, get help. This is my pet peeve. People will say, I'm lonely. Great, go make friends. I don't want to. Well, fuck you. I'm fat. I want to get skinny. Go to the gym. I don't want to. Well, then fuck you. Life is not anything more than what we think it is, which is like, again, maybe the Big Bang, maybe Neanderthals, maybe this, maybe this, maybe God, maybe this. You have to make a decision about what reality you're living in. If you think you have no free will, then go fuck off, huh? Leave me alone. If you think you have free will and agency, then utilize it. Not in the hustle culture way necessarily, depending on your bubble, maybe in a Zen way, maybe in a philosophy way, maybe in a church way, but pick and choose your battles. Right now, you have a choice. Watch this video, like it, subscribe, become a member, join my OnlyFans, or don't do any of those things and watch somebody else. Maybe watch somebody else who tells you, oh, you are lonely, you are depressed, stay that way. Because that's what she's saying. She's basically saying that we know we're all addicted, we all know we're not touching grass, and we all just keep doing it. So we're hoping someone comes and rewrites the whole system. Why? Why do some of us not need the system to be rewritten?
because some of us hold ourselves completely responsible for our own joy and happiness. It's not my mom's job. It's not my partner's job. It's nobody's job. It's mine. It's mine to pick the right partner. It's my responsibility to have boundaries with my mom. It's my job to pick the right to pick the right job. It's my responsibility because I'm the only one who knows my own brain. I'm the only one who knows how to make myself happy. So I have to communicate that to other people. Other people don't communicate to me how to make me happy. Do you guys get what I'm saying? And fulfillment over profits. <clears throat> While we wait this revolution, well, maybe just try to spend a little extra time with your family and friends over the holidays. They might need it and you might need it too. Um, it's interesting. I saw it happen to note all of these. Hey videos. guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully. Okay, well, that's the end of the video, I guess. It wasn't a very long one. So again, hold on, let me switch this out. So again, I'm living in a world where I grew up during a time where men were telling me women were lazy, women just wanted things handed to them, women want this, women, and then I went out and I got it and I did things and it still wasn't good enough for a lot of people, right? A lot of people still had a lot of opinions about how I was failing, a lot of opinions about how my life was easy because I'm a woman. It's like I get to hear two different things constantly, constantly where I'm like, I just don't get it, right? At the end of the day, I can't trust anyone to tell me how to be happy or joyful because they don't know me. They can only know the version of me they've curated in their head. Every time you meet someone, there's a version of you out there in the universe that isn't quite whole. The only version of you that is whole is the version that lives in your head with you. If you feel yourself feeling like you don't even have a relationship with yourself, start to have one. If you guys have watched me on YouTube for a long time, you know that I've been very, like a many different Britneys. And every Britney was lonely and feeling abandoned by the world until this Britney. This Britney finally spent time with herself and asked herself, what do you want? Not what the bubble tells you, not what the world tells you. What do you want? And I want peace. I want quiet. I want to either be seen or you don't need to hang out with me. I would rather kill myself than end up in a relationship or marriage where I feel lonely. But a lot of you are willing to settle and that's fine, but then you can't complain about it. And if you're going to complain, do it to somebody else because my empathy, my sympathy spoons, I don't have a lot, boo-boo. I only have time for people who are willing to change and willing to get better and willing to face themselves. Everyone else, go be lonely and complain on the internet like you always do. Not to be such anti Britney right now, but I'm literally sick of it. I'm bored by it and I'm done. Either get ready to change, which is possible. That's what I'm telling you. Do you hear me or no? Are you too blindsided by your own like ego and narcissism? You can change. You can get better. You can find love. You can be seen. If you want it, it's accessible. If you don't want it, stop watching my channel and leave me the fuck alone right? Because there are plenty of people that are in my community that are doing the work and changing their lives every day. And those are the people that deserve our time. If you think you're undeserving, that is a mental health crisis, right? Unless you're not willing to do the work, well, then it's just a choice. Do you see the difference? We all have mental health problems. I have borderline, a mental illness that literally tells me that I'm consistently abandoned and worthless and a piece of shit. And I have intrusive thoughts that I have to deal with every day, including today, where I'm so ugly and worthless, I should just slam my head against you know, a glass window and kill myself. And then I still have to fight that mental illness, fight those intrusive thoughts, get up in the morning. I still have to get ready and do my calls and go to work and be productive because that serves my joy, even if all of those things are happening at the same time. If you find that my content isn't helping you, watch somebody else. But if you're like me and your brain works in that way where it's really destructive and loud and intrusive thoughts, I'm telling you, you can get better. But it has to start with you. It has got to be about you. It cannot be about other people because other people don't and cannot read your mind they do not know you the way you know yourself, even if they keep telling you they do. You ever have a mom like I do who goes, Betsy, I know you better than you know yourself and it feels a little gaslighty? It's because it is. Only you know yourself. If you're willing to face yourself, if you're willing to admit out loud who you are, then you can fix the problems you're facing. If you cannot do that, you probably will die alone. And maybe that's just a part of the evolutionary process. Hope you guys have a great day. Happy New Year.
Talk to you guys soon. Bye. It, it's such a hard thing to encourage, too, because it requires discipline. And if you're not raised with discipline, if it's not a, it's not incorporated into you very early, it's, it takes a monumental shift in the way you think about life to incorporate that. How do you do that with your, with your children? Well, fortunately, my kids have been around me when I've been, you know, during the time that they're alive, I've been at my most disciplined and most best. Mm -hmm. You know, thank God they weren't around me when I was 21. Right. You know, and they, they, they're seeing an example of someone who works hard and works all the time and has a lot of discipline and also wants to talk to them about things. And I want to talk to them about the value of difficult things and about failure and about uh, like sports. They're involved in sports, which I think are very important to kids. You, you certainly can develop assholes through sports, but I think there's something about winning and losing and effort and reward for that effort that's a vital part of being a human being. And through that, through sports and through any difficult thing, you develop your human potential. I think you only find it through struggle. You only find it through a difficult thing to acquire or a difficult thing to accomplish and then doing that and recognizing that your boundaries are actually movable and that the boundaries that hold you back now are not permanent. That's right. They're just they speak to your state at the moment, but that state you can advance that state and you can you can do things to make your perspective more nuanced and enhance it and and I you know hopefully they can learn from that but there's also the problem that they're growing up in a loving household they're growing up you know the examples they have is of people that are very kind and nice and I think you do need to be exposed to a certain amount of assholes to understand the full scope right. of human beings I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Da, 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 da.